So th thanks, and thanks. I should say thanks to especially to uh, to all the organizers, but in particular Reese. Um, I think this is a really important topic. Um, uh, my background is really actually um, I'm trained uh, in philosophy, and and so so ethics is, is something near and dear to my heart. But um, so I'm actually going to be talking. I'm going to zoom right in. So I'm going to be talking about. So the, my title here is Guiding Principles for Ethical Cryptocurrency, Blockchain, and DLT Research. And I got all three of those in there to be inclusive, and I'll say why in a second. But specifically, I'm going to be talking about research ethics and maybe even research and development ethics. So not whether or not we should do Bitcoin or whether or not we should overthrow the state or all these interesting ethical and political questions, but rather about uh, picking up on this theme around this, um, you know, field building summit, this idea that um, if we as a community, if we're going to try to push this forward, we need to sort of get our house in order. So that's where I'm, I'm zooming in to just kind of research ethics here. <clears throat> so the conclusion where I kind of end up is um, basically I think we actually have uh, an, uh, a a challenge, a real challenge ahead of us because we research what I sort of just call value technologies. And this, I'll, I'll, as you'll see through my examples and stuff, this means everything we do is a lot more difficult than traditional research ethics questions. And so, and I'll, I'll come back to this point. And there's a paper that this is associated with. Um, I won't go into, uh, it's built on this sort of this theoretical model of, um, of, of, uh, of what I call contagion through technology. So it's picking up some of the literature around innovation contagion, ethical contagion. So what did I do? I basically had, um, I did a two, sort of a two-part empirical study here. The first was a lit, uh, just a lit analysis. And I'll just sort of, as a, a side note, mention this little project I work on called the Blockchain Research Network, um, which is where I pulled my literature data from. Uh, right now, it's... Um, at this point, it seems to be the last research bibliography standing. So this is something that might be of value to the research ecosystem. This is why I maintain it. Right now, there's about 3,000 um, books and articles in there specific to crypto. Um, in the next, it never quite lived up to its uh, the vision I had for it. But you'll see in the next, if you keep if you follow along. Uh, the Blockchain Research Network. Um, in the next couple months, hopefully, some things are going to be changing, and and uh, it'll be a, a, a more substantial part of the research ecosystem. So, anyways, um, I analyzed uh, at the time it was uh, uh, just a little over 2,000 items. I looked for res uh, research methods that are described, so that I can pick these up, and then and that's reduced the number down to 79, and then in the end, we have 22 um, with ethical disclosure, and I'll go into this in a second. And then the other part, I went and I surveyed um, active researchers. And here, active was just the simple measure of if you have two uh, items on the blockchain research network, it's a good signal for me that you're a very active kind of researcher. So ended up with 32 complete responses, 17% um, response rate. Uh, important to note here, these are not really robust numbers, but I don't take this to be a problem because I, this is not science in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, some sort of rigor towards truth. We're talking about the squishy world of ethics. And so this is very much descriptive ethics, right? At the end, I'm going to present a couple guiding principles where I'm going to sort of give my normative position, but really it's descriptive ethics. So this is what the community takes themselves to be doing from an ethical perspective. And so I, I ended up uh, analyzing these sort of six ethical themes. I'll go, I'll go into that. So the first one is the literature analysis, just to give you kind of a, like a snapshot of um, this is really just a bouncing off place for me to look at the kinds of methods that are used. Why methods are important is there's a saying in research ethics that your methods determine your ethics. Um, and this is particularly, I'll point out, the stuff around um, active and passive measurement. So those people that are in uh, the um, community of, uh, particularly it's big in the, the computer security community, um, measurement uh, studies are uh, going through a lot of challenging ethical issues right, right now, um, generally for computer security, and we'll see them get reemerge in, in our community um, with kind of a vengeance. <clears throat> so from the survey itself, so I kind of took that and I said, okay, all the people that answered my survey, what are the kind of research methods you use? Here they sort of are. You'll see that 
um, there's sort of a, a general mix, but um, there's a good chunk of sort of computer science folks in there, as well as just your average, you know, humanities people. <clears throat> so the issues that kind of emerge out of this are um, varied, and these are just the kind of ones I thought to be the most salient. So the first is, are people aware of their ethics guidelines? If you work at a university, you're subject to ethics guidelines, whether you want to be or not. Usually in the United States, they call them IRBs, but uh, every country around the world has some version of this. And as it turns out, pretty much everyone knows about these guidelines. There might also be association guidelines and, these, and other places that guidelines, ethical research guidelines come into play. However, as it turns out, um, IRB in particular is not well used uh, specifically by the computer science engineering field. And this is not to place blame because in fact actually there's a large body of literature within particularly again the computer security um, uh, uh, community around the inappropriateness of IRB for what they're doing. They say everything from um, IRBs don't understand my research methods so you know they're not they're not being informative here. Um, in fact, I've even spoke with computer security researchers who say uh, there's a now a trend within the journal literature that says you need to do, have IRB. So they say, okay, great, and they go to their, their IRB and they say, I want to do some, uh, you know, I want to do a, some security testing or something, or I want to do some active measurement. And IRB says this does not count as traditional human subject research. There's not like a human subject you're studying, right? So get out of here. We're not going to do IRB, which put, actually puts them in an interesting bind because they can't publish because now there's this big move towards doing ethical research within these communities. But IRB is not sufficiently educated about to be able to inform them. So it's a real problem. So it's not to place blame. It's a problem. Okay. Um, Another issue uh, I looked into was how we're kind of, especially when the theme of uh, building a, a, a field here, how are we teaching those that are coming up, you know, through the, uh, uh, you know, PhDs and, and, and postdocs and all this sort of thing. Um, as it turns out, um, computer science uh, teachers in particular, uh, I think relatively encouragingly, 66% um, said they taught ethics. 10% use formal guidelines, so there's kind of a lot of ad hoc sort of stuff there. Um, that's not a big surprise. The formal guidelines aren't very helpful in this regard. Software vulnerability disclosure is a big issue. I'm going to return to this, but basically um, lots of the uh, security researchers, those that identified as security researchers, found bugs. They all disclosed them. Interestingly, only 38% were compensated. Um, if you're familiar with this literature around vulnerabilities, um, there is a lot of movement towards creating markets around these to kind of induce the sorts of um, disclosure practices we'd like to see. And so that's actually, I would suggest, a relatively low um, number for co being compensated for disclosures. Okay, a big issue, obviously, is token ownership and disclosure. So as it turns out, 47% of the people bought tokens for research, and there's a pretty big variance for uh, experience, so, which is not so surprising. Those with a little more experience perhaps are a little more willing to take um, risks with respect to their uh, research methods. What I found really interesting is the computer scientists and the engineers were very comfortable with buying tokens for personal use. Now, the problem is they're also not disclosing this. So uh, they're making money, 38% of them earned, a, earned profit, 6% uh, disclosed their ownership in research publications and 16% online. So that's to say most of the stuff you're reading has a conflict of interest lying behind it. And just a, like a prima facie conflict of interest, an obvious one, right? Um, and also industry relations were not well disclosed either. Um, and when, to break that one out a little bit more, um, almost half of people are working with the industry, which arguably is good, but of course it introduces these conflict of interest um, issues. And the reasons why they're working with the industry I, I, I thought was very interesting. Um, reputation is a fairly significant uh, marker here. And, and I think if you have worked in this nexus, you will be familiar with the ways that reputation gets kind of bought. If you're a startup, there's nothing better than to get a couple of MIT professors on your um, advisory board who may or may not do anything 
but they sure as heck do give you that nice patina of, um, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of innovation and, 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 you know, and all that good kind of reputation stuff. Okay, so a little bit of discussion around um, these sort of six themes. Uh, I'm gonna break out three issues. And in the paper itself, I talk a lot, I make, draw comparisons with traditional research ethics. Um, so the first is conflicts of interest. So here we have similar conflicts of interest to any other field, particularly those that are, have commercial applications, right? So we see, um, you know, pharma or ag or any of these, you know, big fields with these challenges. As I mentioned, there seems to be kind of a halo effect used for reputation. Um, there's a number of Nobel laureates that are working for startups, um, and uh, you see a lot of discussion of this kind of notion of buying these sort of the reputation of these top uh, universities. An interesting feature here is that there seems to be a kind of pay to play phenomenon going on here for a lot of research. And so, uh, what I mean by this is particularly people who want to do um, a, a kind of a, a, a practical-minded um, bit of research, you basically need to buy some tokens, right, to be able to do that kind of research. If you want to do, uh, see if you can manipulate a market, well, what do you need to do? The first thing you need to do is go buy some Bitcoin or whatever and see if you can manipulate market. If you want to buy drugs online and see how that works out, uh, that's the step you need to do. These are, um, I'm quoting actual studies that, of course, have been done. Um, so, but that's a real challenge. So there's, how do you, resolve this issue around this pay to play, right? Another big one is these risky research methods. So there is a number of um, formal guidelines that have been developed uh, within specific communities um, to help them out. Uh, we have general, you know, uh, there's if, uh, ACM, uh, you know, ethics guidelines, these sorts of things. We've got more specific ones like the Menlo report. Um, if you belong to particular associations, be it you, you uh, well, not, an, I was going to say an economist, but actually economists quite famously don't have a code of ethics. Um, <laughs> But uh, if you're an anthropologist, there is, you know. So, so there are, you might be subject to guidelines anyways. We, do, of course, don't have any of that, right? And so I think this is an important part of this field building that we need to kind of consider. So some of the research methods we're using um, actually are pretty dangerous. Uh, I would like to point out the big one for me is this, what's called passive and active measurement. Um, so this is going out and, and looking at um, uh, people on the network, right? Going, you could study to see how transactions are being made and, and so on and so forth. Um, active measurement being where you actually induce the behavior you're looking for. So you don't just uh, sort of naturalistically study it, but rather you create it and then study it, right? So you're almost like a chemist in a lab. And I think the experiment and lab notion here is, is, a, is a valuable one to think about. So of course, one of the problems is consent. This is a problem that exists anytime you're doing internet research, right? But it's definitely a problem here. Um, it's a big problem because often you're gonna be exposing illegal activities. You're literally gonna be seeing people buying drugs, right? Um, now, this is a problem if you do, say, do de-anonymizing research, because you are potentially exposing um, your research subjects without their consent to their very, you know, sort of dicey, in many cases, illegal kinds of uh, behavior. And then there's also this risk of uh, dual use or misuse of research methods. And so this is from, this is a, a picture I took from, from uh, Ari's uh, talk yesterday. And uh, uh, this is not to place blame on, on what, they were, what they were doing, but it's a great example of the sorts of um, challenges that, can, uh, that you can have with your research that become basically unintended consequences. So I mentioned de-anonymization. There are cases in which um, de-anonymization research has actually been then taken up by uh, law enforcement for their obvious reasons of what they're doing. So if you have, if you're doing this research, you need to think very carefully about how your research, your research methods might be uh, reused or misused. And similarly, um, Ari was talking about how uh, they 
unintentionally created the bot community with a, with a blog post, right? This is, and this is not that they intended to, but this is a, a, a consequence of them doing this research. Um, and then the other one is um, Philip Dian's uh, uh, Twitter quote or Twitter survey up up there. So very not scientific, but pulled uh, the community and asked whether or not it was okay to break production, um, uh, you know, mainnet uh, smart contracts in a classroom assignment. So this is one of these tensions. Of course, the computer security um, community has to deal with this all the time. Do you teach? hackers in the classroom and how do you kind of do this appropriately. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but because, uh, you know, security through obscurity is not the answer, but it's uh, obviously very dangerous. And one of the reasons, of course, why it's so dangerous here and more so than your um, average, you know, teach a kid how to hack uh, situation is because this is value itself. You're not just breaking into a social network or you know, some other system which may be relatively val uh, important, you're literally teaching them how to break into the bank. So that changes the situation from an ethical perspective. And then finally, um, disclosure practices are particularly challenging for us. So to draw a comparison, there's this famous case of this um, hematologist at the University of Toronto who uh, disclosed adverse drug effects. This is one of these famous ethics cases, right? And um, the uh, drug companies did not much care for her disclosing these um, adverse effects and attacked her. And actually, University of Toronto um, just piled in on it as well. And so it was a re and it, her reputation was was severely tarnished um, by doing the right thing of making these disclosures. Right? We had the same kind of issue. Um, and again, perhaps even more so than these other communities. So um, Corey Fields, um, sort of many of you will be uh, quite familiar with this sort of famous case of um, finding, finding a vulnerability in Bitcoin Cash, where he basically had to report the vulnerability anonymously because he felt that um, you, uh, you know, if the vulnerability had been used prior to his discovery of it, he'd have no way of saying, no, that wasn't me, right? So, which is all to say that vulnerability disclosure in crypto is not up to the task at all. And so we have this sort of little um, uh, thing by uh, Iman Gensur, who says it's a choose your own security disclosure adventure. So it's a real, it's a real problem that these, you know, dealing with these uh, critical assets, um, you know, the critical systems, we don't have the kind of disclosure practices necessary. And then there's finally, there's the no-coiner solution, which is just don't buy in in the first place and your sort of conflicts of interest are really simple and everything. But the challenge there, I think, is that you do lose a kind of privileged access and there are situations where the pay-to-play thing is just a necessary part of doing this kind of research. You just have to buy in. So with that, I'll just quickly go through. So that was sort of the descriptive world. I'm just gonna very quickly kind of give my like, here's my eight guiding principles for how we should be doing ethical cryptocurrency and blockchain research. And this is just the starting point. You know, this is where I like to the conversation to kind of get going from. So the first one is develop a research life cycle. This is common in, ph in pharmaceutical research, right? You before you start your research, you say, here's how we're going to take care of our assets. Here's how we're going to do our research. And here's, and, and we're going to chart it all out and we're going to follow that, right? So this would include, your research life cycle would include, what are you going to do with those tokens when you're done with them? You're going to burn them. You're going to donate them. You're going to whatever, right? Despite the real challenges with IRBs, I think it's really important that we do need to, especially as a community, reach out to um, these uh, ethics, these formal ethics uh, organizations and educate them and get them part of our um, ethics building here. And I think there's actually an opportunity for, because we have such challenging, um, such challenging ethical space here, we can actually do a little ethics innovation here. This is an opportunity for us to take the cool tech we have, the brilliant minds, and all the difficult challenges we have, and actually come up with better ways of doing ethical research and, and, and getting those guidelines in place. So another sort of wild uh, number three is, is 
to dis we, I think we need to disclose our, our, uh, our conflicts of interest. And this is just a, a, a simple one um, that we should all be doing. If, if you have, uh, I maintain on my website, I have a little disclosure thing that says, this is you know, roughly how much you know, crypto I have and the relationships I have with companies and this sort of thing. And we sh that's a, a, like a very simple low bar we should be, we should be hitting. Number four, I think we need to consider, uh, whenever possible, using uh, alternative methods of research. So this would be like test nets, uh, making sure you have, you, in advance, you set up your bright line prohibition. So when you're not going to um, uh, step over some, some ethical lines, because as you research, of course, you discover new things, and all of a sudden, you, it's tempting to be like, well, we should follow that up, right? But that might be, you might be sort of lulled into making a, a, a research ethics mistake. Uh, I think we need to protect and dis, uh, dispose of uh, dangerous methods. So uh, the fact that you're doing this research means you need to um, come up with safeguards to make sure that everything from the police and intelligence agencies don't come by and, 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 and ask for it, as well as it doesn't get out of um, you know, misuse by, uh, by the community themselves, like, like Ari's example with the sort of that front running uh, you know, case that their, their research exposed. Um, we need to disclose software vulnerabilities, even though recognizing that we don't have any good measures for this. I think we, you know, that's a, a bare a bare requirement. Um, but software disclosure, uh, software vulnerability disclosure, continues to be a persistent problem. Whenever you do pay to play, we should minimize our the how much you're buying. And finally, I think that it's at this point of our you know, of our community development, it's unrealistic to expect that we're gonna have top-down, um, you know, formal guidelines. So I think probably the way to go would be bottom-up from the lab. Each lab should be developing their own guidelines around eth their ethical research and deploying those. And then, you know, some future date we can, when we have all these wonderful um, associations and whatnot, we can formalize those at a different level. But I think right now it probably just needs to start from, from labs. So. What I think this all means is that we actually have a more difficult time with research ethics because these are technologies of per se value. That's value in, them, in, this, in themselves. And I think that this introduces new ethical risks akin to bio or nanotechnologies, bio dealing with you know, living things, nano with very small things. We're dealing, we're dealing with valuable things. And so I think that changes the paradigm of what um, we're researching, and I think it makes issues around research ethics even more difficult. And that's all I have, thank you. Great, thank you, Quinn. So let's do some questions from folks, and we're gonna go to Ellie first. Thanks, um, I have lots of questions, but I'll, I'll try and keep it to one. Um, so during the Dow exploit, I I had Dow tokens. You can all laugh at me behind my back later. I had, I had a um, okay, and you know it was worth it for the drama that mm -hmm. ensued. Actually, um, but the what what I found really interesting about that was you know, and looking at that Philip Dion survey, you know they they published the replay attack, you know before it happened, and. We don't know if that's what caused it. And I called that out on Twitter and said, hey, what about the human ethics in this as a humanities or, you know, anthropology kind of researcher and got zero response. And I was appalled that they would publish that in a way that possibly enabled it to happen unless they were the actual attackers, which is also possible. Um, but, yeah, so I suppose the, the, the question there around those security things is the – you know, the, you want to be able to raise these security faults and issues, but you want to, there, there needs to be an ethics around um, giving developers a chance yeah. to repair things before you go live with yeah. it as researchers, yeah. which so they did not this, do. What is one of these fundamental t tensions around, especially this community takes tra transparency very, very seriously, right? We've seen many of the talks um, over the last uh, two days that really trumpet transparency as being something really important. Well, this is a case where transparency is not always necessarily the right move. Now this, just to, for those that don't know, this um, software vulnerability discussion is one that is a much 
bigger discussion. And so we've got some standard divisions around what's called full disclosure, which is you find something, you just tell the world right away. Most people today in the computer security uh, community think full disclosure is no good. <clears throat> um, so now we've got, emerged this notion of of uh, responsible disclosure, which is basically, so I find a bug in Facebook, I go to Facebook, <clears throat> I say, I've got a critical bug, they say, sign this NDA, I sign the NDA, and then there's some negotiated amount of time where they have to fix it, it's like 90 days or something, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and, and then that's, and then they fix it or whatever, and so, and then after 90 days, I, I publish my, you know, my, my, my article on this and, and, and I got my, you know, everyone thinks, oh, it's so great. Quinn discovered this thing and what a good thing and this sort of thing. But it's also been patched in the meantime. There's tensions there because oftentimes companies don't really want, you know, hackers sniffing around. And so uh, your version of a critical exploit and mine as a crappy company might be two different things. And so I might just refuse to fix it. And so that's when people go, well, I'm going full disclosure. I'm going to let the world know. And you're going to have to suffer the consequences. So it's a challenge. Yeah, um, I was wondering, so in a decentralized system, is that a challenge, for example, um, when you want to do responsible disclosure, who is responsible for coming up with a solution? And could a system like a Google Zero project uh, exist? Yeah, I, I mean, presumably a, an exploit will originate in one, you know, it'll be the this wallet or <clears throat> this, you know, uh, core protocol or something. So uh, I would think, but it's, it's a challenge if there's no one, if there's, you know, we, uh, many of the entities that are, you know, in our community are very loose. So it's, there's not a lot of, I mean, this is a kind of a question of governance too, right? I mean, who do you disclose these things to? I don't know, right? So do you identify a boundary in the case of these technical bugs from essentially economic or logical bugs? Because if you're exploiting a smart contract that's working as intended, but as intended it works differently than sort of intended in the economic sense, then I feel like you're starting to tread on a line where we get back to the normative questions of the community having the properties discussed in their earlier talk. And it's not that one is right or wrong per se, but there's like this fuzzy line as you transition from an implementation error to a you intentionally implemented an algorithm that has a property that maybe you didn't want it to have, but the algorithm was what you specified and it's working as intended from a implementation perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I'll just, that strictly speaking, I don't think is necessarily a research ethics question, so I'll dodge there, but I do think that this is definitely um, something that we need to deal with. The DAO being a, a, yeah, the DAO is a great example of this, right? I mean, it, it, it was, there was just a tremendous amount of tension around. I mean, I, I, when I was writing about it, I really didn't even know what to call it. Is it an exploit? Is it an attack? It's not, it depends on what you, how you feel about the, the politics of it. It's arguably not an attack. It's just a clever guy, you know, making the right decisions or something, right? And so it's a real, it's a real challenge. And, and, and I mean, the community came up with, you know, with what we all know what happened. Um, whether or not that was the right decision is, I, I don't know. Is there always a yes? Is, do I need like you know three value logic to discuss this? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there's simple answers there. I don't think, and, and I think the way we should approach it rather is to uh, put principles in place so that we can avoid most of those issues. There's always going to be, I mean, you know, there's there will always be these big momentous cases that we're going to have to deal with. In, of the moment, right? But if we have some, you know, it's like it's like standard, you know, we work in a company, you have a standard risk management, like you have like a playbook, right? What happens? Well, we just look at the playbook and here's how we can help, these give us some principles as to how we can sort out what we think is the right course of action. We'll do like uh, two more questions maybe. This may go to this slide a little bit. Do you feel like the value of value is appropriately valued in our world? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, is this sort of, you, you're sort of, is this bouncing off uh, uh, sort of Reese's comment about this, this notion of this, 
uh, oxymoronical. Uh, no, more about like, um, so like here we're, we're saying like if, if you're playing with money, that's con- comparable to playing with life. Um, so I, I kind of wonder if like we, we as human beings just don't, especially in the West, we don't quite understand what money means or like what, what it could mean to certain people. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think this is one of the interesting um, big picture changes that we, that we probably don't, talk about enough we just assume um we have a whole new dimension of our life that has now been made secure or decentralized whatever money right i mean this is a very uh profound shift in society um i mean while we're at it i think what's interesting is actually i think crypto is kind of eating the world in this regard right because what's next well voting's next there's all these really essential parts of who we are as humans that are changing. And, um, and then, and I worry about like, even just the financialization of these mechanisms, right? That's, it's a real, I mean, that's a separate, these are separate discussions, but these are, I think these are real profound issues. And while I think it's great that I want to support Libra's effort to, um, make remittances cheap, uh, so people can, you know, transact around the globe. That's great. Right. But, um, I think there's a lot of, there's a heap of challenges there as well. One more question. Cool. I, it may be the same question here. But, um, when you say comparable risks to bio and nanotechnologies, do you mean comparable in size, you know, threatening to humanity as such, or do you mean comparable in kind? So that the risks that we see in these other technologies, are you inviting us to think about the kinds of ethical risks or are you just saying I think both both and so actually i was having a conversation with sasha last night about this this tension here um right now the uh the um impact you know as reese was sort of intimating before the impact is not so big that we're not gonna you know we we don't have crypto too big to fail type of you know we're not gonna see systemic uh crashes across entire economies if one cryptocurrency goes out or whatever, right? Of course, the future might be different there. So I do, so I do mean it in that regard, but I also actually do think that, and I'll put my like philosopher's hat on here, I think we're actually dealing with um, a shift in ontology. So I think money itself has, um, and by, by money I mean actually really value or something, you know, not narrowly defined sense of value. I think that has actually changed. And so, and in the same way that I think biotechnologies, nanotechnologies are ontologically speaking, getting at something rather different, right? There, there, so it is a sense of a kind. So I think this is a new class as it were, right? We have biotechnologies, nanotechnologies and value technologies for whatever we want to kind of call them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Let's give Quinn a round of applause. Yeah.